Hello there, YouTube. Normally I would not respond to someone as young as the person in question, and so I'm going to take a more educational tone so that this person could potentially learn and get resources that would better help him gauge and measure and evaluate. I'm responding to a video on drone strikes done by a user called A Progressive Thinker. If you watch my videos a lot, you know that I'm not really a huge fan of Obama. I mean, in my eyes and in the eyes of reality, he's really just a soft neocon. He's not a liberal or a progressive. And now, you seem to imply that liberal, which is a very broad stroke, is... I don't know, are you referring to the liberal in the context that most people would assume you're thinking of? But you could also be meaning a classical liberal, someone who believes in highly unregulated markets. That's a very broad stroke, and you can mean a lot of different things. And when it comes to the way you use it, you seem to imply as if progressive is inherently good, or liberal is inherently good, and that is a very, very bad way of thinking. Sticking to just strictly one school, one way of thinking, is very bad. And I highly recommend you read literature and, and start trying to think about things from different perspectives. Today I'm going to be talking about his new passionate speech on drones. Let's play it. As much of the criticism about drone strikes, both here at home and abroad, understandably centers on reports of civilian casualties. There's a wide gap between U.S. assessments of such casualties and non-governmental reports. Nevertheless, it is a hard fact that U.S. strikes have resulted in civilian casualties, a risk that exists in every war. And for the families of those civilians, no words or legal construct can justify their loss. For me and those in my chain of command, those deaths will haunt us as long as we live just as we are haunted by the civilian casualties that have occurred throughout conventional fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq. But as Commander-in-Chief, I must weigh these heartbreaking tragedies against the alternatives. To do nothing in the face of terrorist networks would invite far more civilian casualties, not just in our cities at home and our facilities abroad, but also in the very places like Sana'a and Kabul and Mogadishu. Oh, come on, Obama. You're exaggerating what the realistic options are. Do you know how many civilians are actually being killed by these drone strikes? Considering the fact that in that speech segment that you highlight, Obama actually acknowledges that there are civilian casualties. But not only that, he also acknowledges that there are mass discrepancies or wide discrepancies between non-governmental reports and governmental reports. This would acknowledge mean that he has obviously heard of these reports and might have some clue as to what they contain. So I'm sure he's well aware of the number of drone strikes, as aware to the options. The president gets briefings. He has advisors that go over these and, and discuss this stuff with the president. So I'm sure he's well aware of your, op your options that you're going to throw out here. But anyway... Let's continue onward. America doesn't have to be isolationist. There are more options than just doing nothing or using drone strikes which have killed hundreds of innocent people. We can even do what we did in the Bin Laden raid in Abbottabad in 2011. Civilian death count in the Bin Laden raid? Zero. Let's look at the Bin Laden raid. When we went in, we actually crashed stealth helicopter. No one was hurt, but that could very well have not been the case. And on top of that, to keep the classified secrets of said stealth helicopter secret, and cl still classified, we blew it up. We destroyed it. Secondly, when we went in, we had to keep our actions secret and tailor them very carefully. Because doing what we did easily violated Pakistani sovereignty. 
In fact, that's why John McCain said toward the 2008 campaign that he would not have done what Obama did. This leads me to believe that either you aren't aware of the way Pakistan felt about the bin Laden raid, or you don't understand what sovereignty is. Doing the same action over and over and over again is probably going to piss Pakistan off a lot, much like our drone strikes are. Now, what I find interesting is how you keep saying, oh, zero death, civilian deaths. The problem with bringing that up is that in one instance of where sending an armed team resulted in no civilian casualties, you have taken this instant and used it as some sort of way to argue that in all instances of using an armed team, then no civilian deaths will result. And this is a logical fallacy. It is a fallacy of composition. Now, I do not like armed teams, and here is why. When you are sending in an armed team, you have more human elements. Let's say a team of five people. That is five people going into a combat zone. Five people who don't know how fearful they are, how jumpy they are, what their ability is to judge. And they're going to be getting shot at and have to worry about being killed. When that is happening around you, your judgment is not always going to be the best. And so, more civilian deaths could easily result. Whereas in a drone strike, you have a person piloting that drone who is out of the line of fire. That person, if he is being fired at, will not die. He might have, you know, a loss of a several million dollar drone, but he won't be killed. And I think that's why I like drones a lot, because they're precise and they take our troops out of harm's way. Yet there's also a downside to that latter part, and I will get to that a little bit later on when it's relevant. Yet hundreds of innocent civilians are dying because of drone strikes. Here, let's look at the numbers. Between 2004 and 2013 in Pakistan, 411 to 884 civilians have died, 168 to 197 children have died, and 1,173 to 1,472 people have been injured because of drone strikes. In Yemen, between 2002 and 2013, 14 to 49 civilians have been killed, two children have been killed, and between 62 and 144 people have been injured because of drone strikes, and a possible additional 25 to 48 civilians killed, 9 to 10 children killed, and between 76 and 98 people injured, all because of drone strikes. Between 2007 and 2013 in Somalia, 0 to 15 civilians have also been killed, and 2 to 24 people have been injured because of drone strikes. Playing with yourself might not be a sin, but masturbating with statistics is. When we look at the statistics you provided, I have one major issue with that, is because the only two categories really laid out by these statistics are civilians and non-civilians. And that's a problem for me. It doesn't really break down what were military combatants or other military personnel or other non-combatants. There's a lot of different things that, better ways that should have been categorized. But anyway, when we look at the statistics you provided us, let's take the numbers on the high end of the scale in each instance. You have where in Pakistan, a total of 1,081 civilians, and that's adding up the numbers of children and the number of civilians. That's 1,081. You subtract that from the total number of people killed, and you will get 2,452. Divide both by the total number of drone strikes, and you'll get a ratio of about 7 to 3. And that ha is rounding up, because after all, you really can't kill 2.9 people. So, on an average drone, on the average, a drone cycle could take out 7 non-civilians and 3 civilians. When we look at the numbers for Yemen and do the exact same, you'll find out 51 civilians have been killed and 56 drone strikes, and 200 and 96 non-civilians have been killed in 56 drone strikes, leaving you a ratio of 6 to 1, with there being a guarantee, as 51 is a smaller number than 56, 
that no civilians have been killed in those drone strikes, assuming that those high numbers are the correct numbers. Which would then lead me to bring up the fallacy of composition again and ask if, because of that instance where there was drone strikes with zero civilian casualties, should we use drone strikes all the time? Finally, when we move on to Somalia and use the high numbers, yes, there were more civilians killed than militants. However, you fail to bring up the number of people killed in the other category they list, which is other CIA ops. And those other covert ops, seven, which is a little under half the maximum number killed of 15, to 42, well over double that of civilians were killed, plus two to three, or one to three children, I believe it was. So, there were more people killed in other CIA ops than drones. Now, the question then for me, and I'll have a former Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, put context to this, is are we doing more harm than good? And then when we take the numbers for other covert operations and the number for drone strikes in the case of Somalia for their civilian casualties, and compare it to, say, casualties of, say, I don't know, Al-Shabaab, one of the groups in Somalia that we target with our drones. Let's look at those numbers. Well, we are killing a lot less civilians than they are. But that's looking at harm in a purely mathematical sense, and, and that's a very poor way to look at it. And I think you would agree to that. So I'm going to have these two clips from the Fog of War, which I'll leave a link to that documentary below. And I'm going to then add my commentary on at the end. The choice of incendiary bombs, where did that come from? I think the, the, the issue is not so much incendiary bombs. I think the issue is in order to win a war, should you kill 100,000 people in one night by firebombing or any other way? LeMay's answer would be clearly yes. McNamara, do you mean to say that instead of killing 100,000, burning to death 100,000 Japanese civilians in that one night, we should have burned to death a lesser number or none, and then had our soldiers cross the beaches in Tokyo and been slaughtered in the tens of thousands? Is that what you're proposing? Is that moral? Is that wise? Why was it necessary to drop the nuclear bomb if LeMay was burning up Japan? And he went on from, from Tokyo to firebomb other cities. 58% of Yokohama, Yokohama is roughly the size of Cleveland. 58% of Cleveland destroyed. Tokyo is roughly the size of New York. 51% of New York destroyed. 99% of the equivalent of Chattanooga, which was Toyama. 40% of the equivalent of Los Angeles, which was Nagoya. This was all done before the dropping of the nuclear bomb, which, by the way, was dropped by LeMay's command. Proportionality should be a guideline in war. Killing 50 to 90 percent of the people of 67 Japanese cities and then bombing them with two nuclear bombs is not proportional, in the minds of some people, to the objectives we were trying to achieve. I don't fault Truman for dropping the nuclear bomb. The U.S.-Japanese War was one of the most brutal wars in all of human history. Kamikaze pilots, suicide, unbelievable. What one can criticize is that the human race prior to that time, and today, has not really grappled with what are, I'll call it the rules of war. Was there a rule then that said you shouldn't bomb, uh, shouldn't kill, shouldn't burn to death 100,000 civilians in a night? 
LeMay said, if we'd lost the war, we'd all have been prosecuted as war criminals. And I think he's right. He and I'd say I were behaving as war criminals. LeMay recognized that what he was doing would be thought immoral if his side had lost. But what makes it immoral if you lose and not immoral if you win? What is morally appropriate in a wartime environment? Let me give you an illustration. While I was secretary, we used what's called Agent Orange in Vietnam, a chemical that strips leaves off of trees. After the war, it is claimed that that was a toxic chemical, and it killed many individuals, soldiers and civilians exposed to it. Were those who issued the approval to use Agent Orange criminals, were they committing a crime against humanity? Let's look at the law. Now, what kind of a law do we have that says these chemicals are acceptable for use in war and these chemicals are not? We don't have clear definitions of that kind. I never in the world would have authorized an illegal action. I'm not really sure I authorized Agent Orange. I don't remember it, but it certainly occurred. The use of it occurred while I was secretary. Norman Morrison was a Quaker. He was opposed to war, the violence of war, the killing. He came to the Pentagon, doused himself with gasoline, burned himself to death below my office. He held a child in his arms, his daughter. Passersby shouted, save the child. He threw the child out of his arms, and the child lived and is alive today. His wife issued a very moving statement. Human beings must stop killing other human beings. And that's a belief that, uh, that I shared. I shared it then, and I believe it even more strongly today. How much evil must we do in order to do good? We have certain ideals, certain responsibilities. Recognize that at times you will have to engage in evil, but minimize it. I remember reading that General Sherman in the Civil War, the mayor of Atlanta pleaded with him to save the city. And Sherman essentially said to the mayor, just before he torched it and burned it down, war is cruel, war is cruelty. That was the way LeMay felt. He was trying to save the country. He was trying to save our nation. And in the process, he was prepared to do whatever killing was necessary. It's a very, very difficult position for sensitive human beings to be in. Morrison was one of those. I think I was. Now, to me, Drones are a good thing. They allow us to take out high-value targets like Anwar al awlaki with precision. Not perfect pinpoint precision, but more precise, while keeping our troops at harm's way, out of harm's way. Yet this also presents a very dangerous scenario where, because our troops are out of harm's way, we're a bit too quick to take out targets. And you bring up an example of where this appears to have happened later on in your video. So I don't necessarily think drones are 
objectively a bad thing. Our drone strikes are objectively bad. Like you seem to. But I will say we need to be more careful. More precise. And think long and hard about who we're hitting, when, where, so that we're not killing as many civilians. Because at that point, we're not minimizing evil. And because we're not doing that, we're creating more enemies on the ground. If you found out your family just got killed because of a U.S. drone, you're not going to be too happy with the United States government. So that's why I say we need to be more precise. But at the same point in time, we can't just let groups like Al-Shabaab blow up Mogadishu. It's a very tough and complex question. Politics is very complicated. It's a very difficult thing to get into. And making a passionate speech like you're doing does nothing but inflame the situation. The Obama administration is literally bypassing Congress. Let's look at the authorization for use of military force of 2001. This actually gives the president the authority to strike and use whatever force he feels appropriate to eliminate those that are responsible or give aid or sh shelter, do other various acts of support towards Al-Qaeda and their affiliates who were responsible for the September 11th attack. That was passed by Congress. So the president, using a law passed by Congress, is striking targets that are affiliated with Al-Qaeda, whom he has authorized to strike. I don't see how he bypassed Congress there. I'm pretty sure he's using legislation that went through Congress. Bypassing the Constitution. I would like to see the Supreme Court precedent or the amendment or article you feel the president is violating. And then, if you're laying this down a precedent, I would like to know whether or not you're Supreme Court justice or not. Because if the answer to that question is no, then I don't care. Just like if I were to say gay, banning gay marriage is unconstitutional, and it really means nothing unless the Supreme Court says it is unconstitutional or not. Bypassing the War Powers Act. When we look at the War Powers Resolution and the AUMF, which the President cites as his defense for drone strikes, or as Justice Department does anyway, you can quite clearly see that in Section 2, this does not supersede the War Powers Resolution. So, on all three accounts of you saying the President is bypassing something, you either A, are plain old wrong, or B, you could be right, but we don't know yet. I don't think you are. And even if you are, really doesn't matter right now because the Supreme Court hasn't weighed on it. Where terrorists seek a foothold. Remember that the terrorists we are after target civilians. And the death toll from their acts of terrorism against Muslims dwarfs any estimate of civilian casualties from drone strikes. Where foreign governments cannot or will not effectively stop terrorism in their territory, the primary alternative to targeted lethal action would be the use of conventional military options. Conventional air power or missiles are far less precise than drones and are likely to cause more civilian casualties and more local outrage. And invasions of these territories lead us to be viewed as occupying armies. So it is false to assert that putting boots on the ground is less likely to result in civilian deaths or less likely to create enemies in the Muslim world. The results would be more U.S. deaths, more Black Hawks down, 
more confrontations with local populations, and an inevitable mission creep in support of such raids that could easily escalate into new wars. Yet again, you're acting like there's only three options. We do nothing, we use drones, or we invade. But no, that's not the case. There are plenty of other options. You're just not exploiting them. I'm pretty sure the president already covered your boots on the ground scenario where he talks about the various problems in sending in armed teams, and if we look at the statistics for Somalia that you showed, other CIA operations are less precise than the drones. And he also covered airstrikes, which would mean there's four options. So I guess you might want to rethink that arrogant little display of stupidity that you just gave us. And yes, I'm being a bit of a dick right now. The record. I do not believe it would be constitutional for the government to target and kill any U.S. citizen with a drone or with a shotgun without due process. But when a U.S. citizen goes abroad to wage war against America and is actively plotting to kill U.S. citizens, and when neither the United States nor our partners are in a position to capture him, before he carries out a plot, his citizenship should no more serve as a shield than a sniper shooting down on an innocent crowd should be protected from a SWAT team. That's who Anwar al awlaki was. Now Obama is trying to cover up the killing of Anwar al awlaki by saying what his administration did was constitutional, even though it wasn't. Show me where it was said it's unconstitutional to kill Anwar al awlaki what Supreme Court ruling says so. Secondly, Obama wasn't trying to cover up for it. He's saying outright, I did it. And I think he was right to do so. Mr. Al-Awlaki was actively recruiting for Al-Qaeda, was a high up in their system, their command network. And the only thing that would have prevented him from being hit with a drone strike like any other one was the fact that he was an American citizen. So what did you want them to do? Send an armed team to arrest him? Because I'm sure he would have been going quietly and they wouldn't, he wouldn't have resisted at all and there was a chance he would have been killed then. Have him then sent back to the United States because I'm sure you know Al-Qaeda would just let Anwar al-Awlaki just be sent back to be tried. The logistics just were not there. And the thing is, we knew he was guilty. So in my book, what we did, not necessarily a bad thing. So, yeah. I don't see anything wrong with it. His U.S. citizenship would have only served as a shield, like Obama said it did. And then the Obama administration ordered the CIA to kill al Lockie's son with a drone strike on American soil. This was actually one of the instances that I believe means that we should probably be more careful with drones, and in fact, the president wanted to know why the mistake of killing al Lockie's son was made. And I'll link to a Huffington Post blog post where they cite a book where this has been documented. And that was something that comes up in a quick Google search. Just like finding out that his son was actually killed in Yemen. A sovereign country, not U.S. soil. Mini Ujama flipper. That was where his son was killed. And that also comes up in a quick Google search. I don't know what else to say to you apart from read books, stop living in an ideological bubble. That's really all I have to say to you. So have a good day.